And I have the very great pleasure of introducing a, a good friend of mine. Uh, David Flink is um, an author. He's a co-founder of a mentoring organization called Eye to Eye, and we actually had Eye to Eye uh, at Groves a few years ago. And more than anything, he's uh, an advocate for our kids. And um, he has a, a riveting number of stories, and he's not going to be able to tell them all. But we're lucky to have him here tonight. So, David. Wow, look at you all. Y'all are gorgeous <laughs> and wonderful. And I'm, not even, I'm, I'm mostly speaking about having met your kids the past couple of days. I, uh, I got to fly in here on Thursday and spent all day at the school. And I, I did have some remarks prepared. And um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to tell stories that I told yesterday, uh, partly because Peter came up to me tonight, uh, who was uh, heard a story that I told in the morning and then I told again in the afternoon and he said you have to tell that tonight. Uh, so I'm going to tell you all a story that, uh, that, that Peter recommends but before I do that I have to set some context. So yes, uh, I come to you from out of state, I live in New York, I grew up in Atlanta but what I really want you to know is that I come to you from your children's future. Uh, I'm 36 years old, uh, I have dyslexia, I have ADHD, uh, I am very proud of those labels uh, I would tell you that uh, not so much that I have those things, but I am those things. Uh, dyslexia gave me uh, a journey that I'm still on. Uh, it led me to appreciate education in a way that I never expected and appreciate learning in a way that I never expected. My first memory of um, a learning disability wasn't a really happy one, though. Uh, what I remember distinctly was uh, I was in a, a third grade classroom and uh, I had, you know those like old wooden desks? The kind that like the, the thing doesn't come up, it's just like, uh, like a big hole. But I think the goal of it is to take all the things and you just shove it in and then you're done. When you're done, you win, I think. Um, and I remember having one of those desks and having to, you know, I, I shoved everything in so I thought I'd won, uh, but not knowing a thing about what was going on in the classroom. Um, in large part, when you hit third grade, your goal is to sit still and read well, and I could do neither of those things. Um, but at some point, I started pulling out the things, and all the kids were like reading, and I just couldn't do that because my brain worked differently, and I hadn't been taught to read differently. That happened later in my journey. Um, so I just started exploring in the desk. And um, at one point, I decided it was going to be my job to leave my mark in the desk. So I started trying to like put my name inside the desk. Uh, and I realized this is like a great ADHD tool because when everyone wants you to pay attention, if you're moving, it helps like, keep eye contact, you know, because they don't see what's going on in here. Um, and then one day I pulled back and I looked inside the desk and there were all of these names. And I thought to myself, like, oh, these are my people. Like, this is like, <laughs> if like, a, you know, like, <laughs> someone, the scientist came to look and say, like, oh, this is like the lost dyslexic ADHD republic. Uh, <laughs> We found them, you know? Uh, but then, of course, I, I looked up, and what I didn't know is that one in five people in America and one in five people in my classroom in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, learn and think differently. So I went through most of my learning feeling completely alone. And, and I did get to go to a school. Um, I was invited to leave my school. Uh, <laughs> anyone, any parents here ever received that invitation for your kids? It's a weird invitation, right? Like. You're welcome to not coming to the party. That's, that's what you get to have. <laughs> uh, but I got to go to a school similar to Groves. And um, in the two years that I was there, everything was different. Um, first off, I found my people, right? Like, out the gate, they asked, do you have dyslexia? And I said, yeah, are we allowed to talk about that? And they're like, yeah, no, you can. Um, and everybody was really psyched about it. And you know, some kids didn't have chairs. They just had BOSU balls because they needed to move, you know? <laughs> And that was better than the hands thing. And you know, at the end, you had like great abs, which was also a <laughs> perk. Um, and, uh, and, it, it, and, and yesterday, as I was walking through the school, what I realized is that Groves is like you know, the better version of what I had. And a lot of time has passed. And you know, the school that I went to, hopefully, has also improved. But you know, what I saw yesterday was not an LD school. I saw a school. I saw a terrific school school. 
That's what learning should look like in America. And all of you know how important that is. That's why you send your kids there, and that's why we're raising a lot of money tonight, so more kids can afford to go to what I would say is one of the best schools in America, period. And I speak from experience. I've been kicked out of a lot of schools, so I've seen them. <laughs> Uh, and I've also had the opportunity to visit a lot of schools. Uh, it, you know, it's funny when you're dyslexic and you write a book. Uh, I, like, didn't understand that books matter. I hadn't read that many of them. And all of a sudden, people started inviting me to come and do readings, which I thought was also funny, because I, I don't like reading the book. I'm not going to be... I don't do so much of the reading of the book. I do the writing of the book. Um, so I've seen a lot of schools. Um, and, and Groves really is amazing. So I'm going to tell the story that Peter told me to tell. Uh, and that John actually recommended that I tell the students. So I'm actually blaming this on you, John. Um, and it's the story of when I came to understand that um, having an LD was not what I wanted. I wanted to be LD. So uh, because of an incredible community of teachers and parents, I succeeded through school. And I got to Brown, which was like, like shocking to me that I got to Brown because I didn't think I would go to college. Um, and if you would ask any of my teachers up until about fifth grade when I was invited to leave, they would have agreed. Uh, I was the bad kid, right? Because they realized it was easier to be the bad kid than it was to be the dumb kid. But when I got what I needed, I became the smart kid. But I was not the smart kid with dyslexia or about dyslexia or anything having to do with dyslexia. I was just going to be the smart kid at Brown who hid from his dyslexia. But I had made a choice. Uh, when I got to Brown, I decided I was going to be a teacher. My mom was a teacher. Uh, I had appreciated what teachers had done for me. Um, and I was so crazy about this passion of being a teacher uh, that I would do anything. I was going to be like, because there were dyslexic kids out there that needed me. That's how I was starting to think. Um, so I, did, I looked in the course syllabus and I said, OK, what's the hardest class that I can take in the education department? That's the opposite, by the way, of how I'd operated up until that point. Uh, but I was now doing something for someone else, for the kids that I was going to meet, you know? And so I found this class. Uh, it was taught by Professor Cynthia Garcia Cole. Just the name was intimidating, you know, right? I think there was a hyphen in there somewhere, too, which just adds extra level of gravitas. Uh, and she taught only the senior seminar. I said, I'm going to take that class. So I went, and I, and I, and I talked my way into the class. Uh, and I think basically she let me in because she realized that like, she would not get home and ever see her family again like if I didn't get in. Uh, and I like went home that day very excited uh, to, to start the homework, which was crazy because when you have ADHD, your typical start time for any assignment is about, you know, what, an hour or two before it's due, I think, you know. <laughs> but I, again, this is about the students I was going to serve someday, you know, so I had this extra motivation. So I started working on my first assignment. It was a paper. Uh, I went down to, in our, in, at Brown, there was a room in the library called the Absolute Quiet Room, the AQR great for ADHD, right? You know, they hadn't invented the internet yet, so like, you just went down there and you were just, at, there was no distractions. Um, and I like, you know, typed out my paper on my trusty laptop. When I talked to the kids yesterday about laptops and how game-changing that was for me, they didn't understand. Uh, which tells you about how far we've already come in terms of accommodations and technology, right? But, but I, I wrote the paper, I remember you used to have to press F7, right, to get spell check done. So I did the F7, and it had all the things spell checked. And then um, I had really succeeded in school because I used accommodations, but also because I had had allies. Um, and so I realized I needed an ally. And in this case, I decided my best ally was going to be my new roommate we had just met. Uh, but I knew his name. It was also Dave, which was convenient for me. Uh, good for dyslexics. Um, so I turned to him, and I said, hey, you know, I wrote Frankly, I think the best paper ever written on the topic of education. Now I'm so crazy about this class and so excited about how I'm going to change the world that that's how I'm thinking. Uh, and I said, would you mind reading it? And he kind of, you know, with a hefty degree of apathy said, you know, sure, as long as you take out the garbage. So I, you know, took the garbage down the hall for the one time that semester. And by the time I came back, he had uh, finished proofreading the paper. And uh, it was interesting. I remember, like, I, I was looking through the edits, and um, he, there wasn't a ton of edits. And I thought, well, maybe like somehow wrapped into that college acceptance, I had like overcome my dyslexia. I couldn't figure it out. But, um, but I, you know, I had used my accommodation, and, and I thought that was enough. And a lot of the edits he had suggested I actually didn't think were that great. Um, 
don't know how he got in. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> I, I finished the paper and I turned it in. And this is also before cell phones, so so you all can appreciate that um, I wanted. I figured that like I would get a phone call about how great the paper was, and I couldn't leave my dorm room. Like like my friends were like going out to like parties and things, and I was just like, no, I got to stay home. Like Cynthia may call me at any minute. <laughs> In my mind, I'm calling her Cynthia, by the way, because we're going to be best friends. Uh, after two weeks, I finally get the paper back, like in the normal way, right? Like it's handed back to me in class. And um, in the paper, I had, I had two grades. I had, um, I had an A. I had an A, right? OK. <laughs> See, that's how I should have been, right? Like a bunch of room people like, yeah. But, but check this out. I had a slash. And then she wrote, see me. Yeah, right, she wanted to see me. This is exactly as I imagined. You know, I'm going to go there, and she'll be like, oh, you wrote the best, pe best paper ever, and, like, you know, the president of the university will be there. I'm like, I heard about your paper. I had to come see this for myself, you know, and, um, you know, she'll probably appoint me the head of the education department, and the president will say, oh, well, you should just take my job. There'll be somebody with a trombone there and some flags. It's going to be great. I was ready for her to see me. I was so excited. So excited, so foolish. <laughs> so I go to her office hours. I still remember I, her, her office was uh, her office was scary. It was all wood, <laughs> everything in it. Like the desk was wood. I think it was made of a fallen tree. They just built the university around it. You know, <laughs> every book she wrote. <laughs> but it's okay because this is the place where I was going to get for the first time some true acknowledgement about my success and my future. And so she, uh, she looks at me, she says, you wrote a great paper, but I made a copy for myself. And at this moment, I think, well, that makes sense. Like, you probably want a copy for your own records. I, you know, <laughs> go on. Uh, and, and then she opens up the drawer of her old wooden desk and um, pulls out a copy of my paper. And as she turns it around, I see that it's just bleeding with red marks. And she has successfully found every misspelling. And uh, there were legitimate misspellings. There were the words that are real words but mean different things. So like she asked me why I had spelled 2-T-O uniformly throughout the paper. And I said, well, you know, 33% chance. <laughs> uh, which, uh, <laughs> y'all found that funnier than she did. Um, <laughs> And as she's going on and on and on about all the spelling and grammatical errors, I decided to break a rule, the rule that I was not going to talk about my dyslexia. And so I just blurted out. I say, well, look, you know, I, I, I made these mistakes because I'm dyslexic and I don't know how to, how, to, how to tell the difference between some of these words. And I, I'm expecting the world to just crumble at this moment, right? Like, you are not supposed to say that at Brown University. I'm going to get kicked out, right? That's what I'm thinking. And she just goes, oh, well, well you know, why don't you go to the writing center? I said, what's a writing center? She's like, it's a place you know, full of people who like to proofread. And I'm like, oh, a bunch of people who probably aren't dyslexic. That'd be good to know about, you know? So, I like, so if I take it to this weird, non-dyslexic place and they proofread my paper, I can get back at full A? She's like, yeah, totally. And I'm like, awesome, awesome. So I leave, and I'm like super excited, and then I realize that I am super angry. And who am I angry at? My roommate, that's right, <laughs> David Hyman. <laughs> you can look him up. <laughs> so I go back to my room, right? I'm ready for like an old school intervention. I know how this is done. I've seen it on Law & Order. You put a chair down in the middle of a black room, put a light behind the chair. You sit down in the chair ready for him to come in. You know, you got to have the effect just right. Um, and I'm sitting there for a while, which is super hard for ADHD people. Um, I appreciate, by the way, that I only was allowed 15 minutes for this talk. That's as long as my attention span tends to run, so I'm getting close to the end, I promise. Um, so I'm sitting there in the chair waiting for David Hyman to walk in. And uh, before long, he, he finally comes and he turns on the lights, and that ruins the effects. That already kind of pisses me off. Um, but I jump up, right, you know, and I kind of get up in his face, and I said, I got my paper back. I got my paper back. And he not realizing that we're having an intervention, I think, is kind of like, oh, you know, that's great, you know, I've, the one you've been going on and on about, I'm like, yeah, you know, I got an A, and then I got a slash, and then she wanted to see me, and then I went there, and there was no trombone. He has no clue what I'm talking about. 
And I finally saying, look, there were tons of spelling errors. And you were supposed to help me with that. And I break the rule for the second time. I say, you were supposed to help me with that because I'm dyslexic. He starts laughing. He starts laughing. And then he, he's like laughing so hard that he starts crying, right? And he's like laughing and crying. And there's sort of like a snot situation that starts to occur. <laughs> In the midst of all the laughing and crying and snotting, some words slip out, which is, well, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> Information that would have been valuable to me <laughs> earlier in the revision process, right? And that moment changed my life. That moment changed my life. Because I realized that I am someone who is proud of his learning difference. Not only because I need to like, make sure that the one in five people in America don't end up being the dyslexic people who proofread my papers. <laughs> um, I spent much of my time in college dating for spelling. Not a good way to find love. <laughs> um, but because I wanted to own my story. And my roommate, Dave, um, and a handful of other people uh, started going to a local school called Fox Point Elementary, and we started sharing our dyslexic stories. And uh, I learned something, uh, which is in the eyes of a little kid, you are innately cool when you are a college student. And I did what no one was able to do for me. I was able to say, look, I don't know what happens next, but I know how to do middle school as a dyslexic. And then I got a little bit older, and the first award I ever got was going back to um, my high school to give a speech. And I remembered that the reason why I was invited was simply because I was a dyslexic high school, uh, college graduate. And that's unfortunately how low the bar is to be successful, because we don't tend to own our stories. And then I got a little bit older, and so I needed like other young people to do this. And that became my life and my job. And then I decided to write a book, which is a weird thing for a dyslexic person to do. But I needed to pass on the lessons I had learned on my 36 years on this planet. Um, so I'm going to end uh, with a very short story. Um, which is, I was on a train about a year ago uh, reading the newspaper, listening to the newspaper, let's be honest. Uh, I still, I, you know, I have great decoding skills, but I like my accommodations too, right? And I'm reading this article about this scientist, and he is a cancer doctor and oncologist, and he's literally curing cancer in a way that no one's ever thought of before. And maybe you all saw this article, ended up getting a lot of press, not just in the New York Times, there was a, the front cover of uh, Time Magazine and um, on all of the major news stations, this doctor was talking about this work. And what he had done is everybody thought about curing cancer based on the organ. They'd say, oh, you have lung cancer, we have to cure lung, you know, lung cancer. And you, know, you have pancreas cancer, we have to cure pancreas cancer. He said, well, there's a mutation. And the mutation could be the same in the lung and the pancreas. And as I get to the end of the article, I realize that I've heard this entire story, but in a much more intimate um, space. It was at a dinner party. Um, it was at a dinner party at my best friend from college's apartment, uh, Dave Hyman. He graduated from Brown, uh, went to medical school, went to residency, went to fellowship, and is now the director, uh, the youngest director of uh, cancer research at Sloan Kettering in New York City. And um, he's super brilliant. I never understand half of what he's saying. Uh, and it took the New York Times to translate to me what he's doing. So I end on this note, and this is the part of the story, John, that I know we hadn't had a chance to really talk about the last time I saw you, because this is relatively recent. But this is why we're here tonight, right? We're not just here to invest in our kids because we love our children. Of course we love our children. And we're not just here to raise a lot of money tonight so that some other families can hopefully come here. It's because dyslexic, ADHD, LD, whatever words you like, those minds hold huge potential. And they are the leaders of our communities, uh, our creative communities, our you know, medical communities. Um, and they're the people that we need, right? We cannot afford to lose them. Because the cure to cancer could live in a dyslexic brain. I have a nine-month-old at home. Uh, she's uh, our first. Her name's Emma. Uh, I love her dearly. Uh, of course you do, right? And I don't know if she's going to be dyslexic or ADHD or not. You know, 75% chance, yes. Hope so. <laughs> I'll know what to do with that. <laughs> if not, she'll take after my wife. That'll be great, too. Uh, but I know why I'm here tonight. I know why I'm not in New York with her tonight. 
I'm here to be with you all because we're gonna change the way we see dyslexia and ADHD in our society. And you know, in 18 years, Emma's gonna be going to college. And regardless of how she learns, I want her to be celebrated for her uniqueness, for her specialness. And that's what this movement's all about. I would say we have a nudgment right now, but we could have a movement. And I think collectively we are citizens of a country that does not yet exist. The LDADHD Republic, as I refer to it. You can think about it. We have to work on the branding. <laughs> um, but tonight, we can all get one step closer to getting to that place. Um, so thank you so much for letting me be a part of this evening. Uh, it's my second time to Groves, but I know it won't be my last time. Thanks a lot.